Hello again, welcome to another episode of the Uranium Market Minute. Today is Tuesday, December 21st, and this is episode number 54. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Justin Hewn. I'm your host. I'm the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro Newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. Before we get into the content, as always, nothing in this video is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing. And always take responsibility for your own choices. Happy uh, winter solstice if you're in the northern hemisphere. Happy summer solstice if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, always enjoy this day out of the year. It feels like a turning point, um, generally speaking, not only with, with the seasons, but also just with uh, things energetically, um, especially in the northern hemisphere with days getting longer. Um, always appreciate this time of year and uh, the, the slowness that happens during these short days and during the winter season in the northern hemisphere. Of course, I know this is a global audience, so uh, the inverse would be true for you guys. But yeah, it does feel like um, things are starting to shift a little bit for the positive, which is uh, just generally speaking, which is nice to nice to see, nice to feel. Um, let's jump right into the daily scoreboard here. Spot price of uranium coming in about 50 cents down from yesterday, 42.87 a pound. As I mentioned multiple times, I expect to see it tick down a little bit towards the, the end of the month. Um, nothing surprising here as Sprott is still out of the market. Their discount to NAV shrunk a bit yesterday, came in uh, as of the open this morning at minus 4.8% uh, discount to their net asset value. Stock is up a little bit today, so I think that gap is closing a little bit with spot price down a little bit. So we're probably getting closer to NAV here, maybe 1% or 2% discount as of currently with uh, about 45 minutes left of trading in, in the day. Um, they did not purchase any new pounds yesterday, nor did they raise any new capital. They remain with 27 million in their, in their uh, account in cash. Since the 17th of August, 23 million pounds purchased, a billion dollars raised, and they have 3.5 billion allocated. The sector equity ETFs, URA reported no redemptions. URNM reported a de decrease of 150,000 shares, give rise to 10.9 million in mandated selling. Looks like uh, the sector continues to try to carve out a bottom here. Interesting, uh, interestingly enough, at the height of the market, in November, URNM had 10.3 million shares outstanding. This morning, it came in at 9.65 million at the drop of only 6.3% in outstanding shares. However, the ETF itself is down about 30%, a little under 30% since the highs. It's been a pretty chunky pullback here. What does that mean? That means that the selling that's happened in the individual equities across the sector has largely not been from ETF redemptions. That's been retail selling it down, perhaps some institutions um, taking some profits on their individual holdings. But of course, the small and mid caps, most likely that's uh, primarily retail. As we've seen, the volumes haven't been huge. So not a lot of redemptions in the ETFs. Of course, that's a good sign. If we had seen heavy redemptions in the ETFs, the selling pressure would have been even greater, which would have been even more painful. The combined AUMs actually decreased again by down about $70 million in the combined AUM between the two ETFs now sitting just under 1.9 billion. Let's take a look at the charts. URA gapping up on the open and trading up throughout the day. That's a big, beautiful green candle there, up 6% on the day. Volume, nothing to write home about. Low, pretty light trading volume, which is typical of the week leading up to the Christmas holiday. Uh, Christmas being this Saturday, December 25th. Um, typically the volumes in trading for those last week or two of the year are usually lighter than normal across all markets. And that is exactly what we're seeing today. However, we're seeing big moves in the uranium equities on lower volumes. To me, that signals that uh, the sellers are starting to get exhausted here. Um, when we had uh, low volume selling on the slide down, some of these big down days on, on lower volume, the buyers were just exhausted. Um, they've been buying the dip for the past few weeks, came in a little bit too early, perhaps. Um, now we're seeing big updates on low volumes. Where are the sellers? The sellers seem like uh, they're not in. They are kind of starting their vacation early. Maybe they're exhausted at this point, too. It does look like I've mentioned before, like I was hoping to see is kind of some sideways chop above that rising 200 day. It's exactly what we're getting. I hope to continue to see that throughout the next week. And I think that we will see a nice reset leading into the beginning of the year. Zooming out, this is a pretty darn good looking bullish chart with a couple of typical healthy pull, pullbacks to that 200 day moving average. Nothing really to uh, be alarmed about. Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, uh, up one and a half percent on the day, kind of selling off throughout the day, but still up. 
Um, like I mentioned, starting out at a bit more, more than 4% discount to NAV, now being up 1.5%. With the spot price falling 50 cents, we're probably pushing my, maybe a 1% discount to NAV, maybe getting close to NAV here. Still, volumes are, are just not there. The rotation of funds into the sector has not resumed and is likely not to resume until the beginning of the year. That's my thinking on this. So would love to see this also kind of chop sideways um, through the next week and a half of trading. Um, I have a quick mailbag question that came in yesterday in a YouTube comment from a uh, comment from Corig 121. He says, Justin, I've heard from many sources, uh, quotations, excuse me, parentheses, the biggest name being Rick Roll, unparentheses, that uranium is about three to 5% of overall cost for a nuclear power plant. If uranium price doubles, it only increases overall output cost a couple percent. With that being the case, why would any utilities bother to focus so heavily on the spot price? So that's a really good question. Um, well, first of all, yes, uh, uranium itself is a pretty small percentage of the overall operating costs. Nuclear plants obviously have a huge, huge sunk cost in the construction and the de development of the plant. And then when it comes to their operating costs, there's also large costs that go into um, primarily the personnel and the people running the plant, right? Um, and also other inputs uh, as far as other elements of the fuel cycle, of which U308 is only a small part of that. So um, while the U308 price is in fact only around that three to 5% of the overall operating cost, and that is the metric that we follow, it doesn't really exist in a vacuum, right? And most of the time, what we'll see is the price of all elements of the fuel cycle sort of move up, not necessarily in lockstep, but generally they'll move in the same direction sort of together. So we've seen the SWU price, the cost of enrichment, um, that's been running up for about two and a half years. And it's up another 10%. This is the third year in a row. It's up double digits year over year. And it rose about 10% this year as well. So the cost of enrichment has been rising. The cost of conversion has come down a little bit, but it's it was up at an all-time high um, this past year. So it's still very high um, on historical standards. Uh, UF6 is also up. And then, of course, U308 is rising. So while, yes, that's only a small percentage of their operating cost, when lumped together with the total cost of fuel, um, you know, U308, UF6, conversion, enrichment, fabricated fuel, when all of those costs go up together, it does move their bottom line. It does make a difference on their books. So um, to say that, oh, well, it's no big deal if uranium goes to $100, it's like, well, I mean, it still costs money, right? I mean, it still affects their balance sheet for the U308, but it also uh, you know, affects the other elements of the fuel cycle as well. So yes, it matters to them. So to say that the prices can double or triple or quadruple from here and it makes no difference to the utilities is just wrong. That's just wrong. And I know that there's a lot of, um, you know, uranium bulls out there that say that, and it's just not true. Uh, with that said, considering the sunk costs that are built into nuclear reactors, an unbelievably high cost of construction, the fact that uh, they're providing energy during what is, you know, playing out currently, which is a major energy crisis, a rising U308 price is unlikely to cause any of these plants to be like, well, we're just going to have to shut off now because the price went from you know, $43 to $65. That's pretty much not going to happen, especially if we see a situation where, um, you know, for in the United States, for example, where nuclear is 20% of the grid, um, in, in markets where some of these reactors have to compete with natural gas and the natural gas price is rising, the utilities are just going to pass that rate on to their customers and or get support from the government to, to remain online. So um, a short-term price spike in the cost of U308 alone is unlikely to actually cause plant closures, in my opinion. Um, however, it does matter to the utilities. So um, the second part of your question was, why do they focus so much on the spot price? Well, the truth is they don't really focus that much on the spot price. Utilities traditionally will seek out uranium deliveries for their units you know, to run through the fuel cycle via long-term contracts. And those long-term contracts can look like a variety of things. Most of the time, they're at least partially referenced to the spot price. But the spot price matters because it's it's more of a it's more of a, a short-term reflection of what the cost of uranium actually is, right? So the long-term price you can you can factor in the cost of capital. In some cases, if it's farther far enough down the line of of, of a term delivery, you can actually factor in uh, you know cost capital cost of development of a project, and all of those things get weighted into the cost of that long-term contract. And so the long-term prices are generally higher. So to have a, a, a contract partially referenced to the spot price over the past multiple years, that has meant a lower price 
uh, when it comes to delivery of that uranium for the utilities. This is one reason why they might pay some attention to the spot price. Um, another reason they might pay some attention to it is because those contracts are referenced to the spot price, a rising spot price that we're currently seeing now is going to affect their future deliveries uh, on any contracts that do have some reference to the spot price, which is probably a lot of those contracts. Now, um, the utilities, in my opinion, are largely out of the spot market currently. That's what we're seeing. That's what we're hearing. Um, we believe that's because they're fully aware of how thin the spot market is, and they are going to do what they can to secure midterm pounds. Um, those That might be happening through carry trades. That might be happening through producers that are getting... Um, that have JVs with uh, Kazadam problem because those are lower cost production. You can still um, you can still deliver pounds pretty confidently out in the two, three, four year time frame at that forty to forty five dollars a pound range. And then we definitely are hearing that utilities are out there putting out RFPs, requests for proposal for long term contracts. We're talking about twenty twenty five to 2030, 2032. Um, we're definitely hearing that. And um, the utilities, like I like I mentioned a few episodes ago, that there was an Asian utility that. Um, has signed a contract with uh, with the Kazakhs for um, a spot reference price of a ceiling of fifty five dollars in the first two years of delivery. This is twenty twenty five and beyond, and the, all the remaining years of that contract with a ceiling of seventy eight dollars a pound, all market reference. Okay, so the producer was not really willing to sign that fixed contract. So this is kind of a long winded answer to say the spot market matters and it doesn't matter at the same time. It matters in that it's obviously the most visible metric that the investing community can watch. It matters in that it in, at this point, it implies the term price. Now, traditionally, the term price would be based on the producer's cost plus their profits to secure and promise those pounds for delivery. One great example of that would be uh, Cameco, who's saying, we, we know essentially at this point, you know, notwithstanding any inflation that will happen and supply chain constraints out in the next couple of years. But at this point, we can say we can produce a pound when we bring MacArthur River back online. We can produce that pound all in sustaining costs for $40 a pound. OK, then they know they can go and they'll, they'll be might be willing to sign a contract partially fixed at 48 or 52 or whatever it might be. And then they also want exposure to that rising spot price. So the spot price matters because currently how it's being driven by financial players, the term price had been pretty stagnant in the mid thirties for, for a couple of years there, right? Um, and as soon as, as Sprott came on the scene and the spot price spiked up to 52, what did we see? We saw the biggest jump that we've seen in multiple years. The, the biggest monthly jump in the term price happened in October. Why? What really changed for the producers that were producing and selling to the term market? That's primarily Kazadam Prom, that's primarily Orono, Uranium One, uh, and perhaps uh, CGN, right? And, and all of these entities have JVs with Kazatomprom. So they're producing relatively cheap. They were signing term contracts in the mid thirties. What changed? Nothing. The spot market changed. And that one month, that's what changed. So the spot market is driving the term market. So now they're paying attention. And I guarantee you they're paying attention to what's going on. And they waited too long. They waited too long to act. And um, they did, you know, they did what was logical for a really long time, which was secure pounds in the midterm market from carry traders. It's just working through that, that above ground mobile inventory that came from a decade of oversupply. That mobile inventory that came from that oversupply is largely worked through. Now we have a thin spot market with a couple million pounds from primary production that's coming into the spot market. We have a bit of liquidity coming from carry traders selling into a backwardated market when it is backwardated. Other than that, the spot market is pretty thin. And the utilities know all it's going to take is another wave of institutional money coming into the Sprott vehicle to clear that out and drive that price up. That's why they're looking out to 2025, 2030. That's why we are likely to see the term price continue to rise with or without the spot market. But I'm pretty sure we know what the spot market is going to do. All right, rant over. Um, a couple pieces of housekeeping. Uh, for Uranium Insider Pro members, we're currently preparing our January 2022 monthly newsletter. It'll be include it will include our outlook for the sector in 2022. In keeping with our longstanding policy, it will be released before the open on Tuesday the 4th, the second trading day of the new month and the new year. So we always uh, publish our newsletter on the second trading day of the month, whatever day that lands on. That's because there's a lot of data that comes in on the first that we need to include in our report. So we're gonna have a very thorough um, report on our outlook for the coming year. Obviously, I've tapped into a num number of elements on this podcast 
Um, you know, you probably know relatively what I'm thinking for the coming year, but we get pretty granular with these new newsletters. We go really into detail and um, it really helps, in my opinion, to understand where our conviction is coming from and to understand why or for what reason I might come on here and tell you that I'm bullish and you listen to a 10, 15 minute podcast every day or every other day. Right. And, and you hear me, you know, try, you know, push the sector and push the newsletter and whatnot, but really in the newsletter, what we do is we get super geeky on it. We get really down to detail and it's much more um, convincing of the overall thesis to get really granular in that data. And that's what we like to do for the monthly newsletter. So that'll be out January 4th on Tuesday. The other piece is that this Thursday will be the last um, Uranium Market Minute for the year, unless there's something that's urgent that I need to express uh, next week. We're going to take a bit of time off and enjoy some time with family um, and enjoy the Christmas holiday. So um, we will be, I, I will be here tomorrow. I will be here Thursday, but Thursday will be our last episode for the year, unless there's something that uh, unforeseen that comes up. So um, I want to thank all of you again for your support and for the great comments for listening and watching. And uh, if you enjoy this content, please like this video, share it around. The more people that are aware of this uranium thesis, the better. And um, I think we're in for a very, very bright 2022 for uranium. Um, and please uh, hit that notification bell and subscribe and you will be notified whenever we publish a new episode, which is almost every day. All right, everybody, have a great uh, rest of your day and we'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.